Hey everyone, welcome to BCP Med. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the strength of various nucleophiles and what factors influence the nucleophile strength. We're also going to be taking a look at leaving groups and what factors influence the quote unquote goodness of a leaving group, right? How effectively that group is able to detach from the carbon it is bonded to. Let's go ahead and get started. The first thing that we should do is to go ahead and define nucleophilicity as it is a term most people are not familiar with until organic chemistry. Nucleophilicity is the quote unquote affinity for a nucleus that is a positive charge to form a covalent bond. Right? This is a little bit different than other definitions like basicity right? because it is specifically the affinity for a nucleus to form a covalent bond. Right? So in the case of arrow pushing, what this looks like is that the nucleophile has an extraneous lone pair, which it can use to donate to the electrophile, which has a partial positive or full positive charge. This then forms a full single bond between the nucleophile and the electrophile. Better nucleophiles will have a lone pair that's easily available and not too tightly held by the nucleus because it needs to be able to give it up to the electrophile in order to form that covalent bond. As a result, anions make very good nucleophiles because they have excess negative charge density and are a little bit more diffuse and have available lone pairs. So for any given atom, a negatively charged species is going to have greater nucleophilic character than does the neutral species. So for example, an amide with a negative charge on the nitrogen is much more nucleophilic than an amine with a, uh, just a lone pair and no charge on the nitrogen. Similarly, an alkoxide ion with an O- is much more nucleophilic than just an alcohol or an OH group. The other thing that we should think about is basicity. Basicity is defined as the proton affinity in the Bronsted definition of a compound, or the electron donating ability in terms of the Lewis definition of a base. Oftentimes, basicity and nucleophilicity are said to correlate because they both have to do with the donation of an electron pair to another species, i.e. a stronger base leads to a stronger nucleophile. However, that definition or that analogy is not exact. Sometimes this is true, but there are plenty of counterexamples. So I personally think it is much more useful to separate the two concepts into distinct spheres rather than thinking of nucleophilicity as just an extension of basicity. The first major factor which impacts nucleophilicity is the electronegativity of the given element. So, in, and this is specifically applies to those first row or period two nonmetals, C, N, O, and F. The higher the electronegativity of the element, the more tightly held its lone pairs are, the more stable they are being on whatever atom they're on. And as a result, those lone pairs are less available and the atom is less nucleophilic. So for example, if we compare hydroxide anion with fluoride anion, hydroxide is a much better nucleophile than fluoride because its electronegativity of oxygen, 3.5, is less than that of fluorine. So the negative charge is a little less stable and a little more willing to go and jump onto an electrophile. Similarly, if we look at neutral species, if we compare an amine, such as ammonia, with a, a species like water or a hydroxyl group that is not negatively charged, the nitrogen is a much more nucleophilic species because it is less electronegative than the oxygen. That sp3 lone pair is much more available to be donated to form a single bond. If you look at it in terms of periodic trends, that means that nucleophilicity increases towards the left-hand side of those nonmetals, where a carbon species would in theory be the most nucleophilic. Indeed, if we look at anionic species, a carb anion is by far the strongest nucleophile. That is things that you see like in Grignard reagents. Amides are also very strong nucleophiles, things like sodium amide. Alkoxides are a little bit weaker, and fluoride is the weakest of those nucleophiles. But, and this is very important, when you go ahead and look at neutral species, carbon does not have a corresponding nucleophile. There's no, carbon never has a lone pair when it's tetrahedral, and so it cannot be nucleophilic. You can't even consider it. So as a result, nitrogen is the strongest sp3 nucleophile, stronger than the alcohols and much, much stronger than hydrofluoric acid. The other major factor which influences the, polar, the nucleophilicity of a substance is its polarizability. And this is much trickier than electronegativity because it's actually dependent on a solvent how this impacts the nucleophilicity. 
Polarizability is defined as how easily distorted the electron cloud is. So if an atom is very polarizable, its electron cloud is very easily skewed towards one side or another, i.e. it is more loosely held. The first way that this impacts nuclear felicity is based on the impact it has on hydrogen bonding. So, for example, let's compare the atoms fluorine and bromine. Fluorine is much smaller and more tightly uh, holding of its electron cloud, and as a result, its polarizability, which is measured in alpha values, is around six times less than that of bromine. As a result, fluorine hydrogen bonds very effectively to water. So wa four water molecules can very easily coordinate each of the lone pairs on fluorine because the diameter and the polarizability of fluorine is comparable to that of the protic solvent, water. However, in terms of bromine, water can still coordinate a bromide anion in a, in a quasi-hydrogen bond, but because bromine is so big and the electron cloud is so loose, water has a hard time finding the electron density to actually coordinate to. And as a result, water very weakly hydrogen bonds to bromine or bromide anion as compared to fluoride anion. In fact, the larger the atom is, the harder time water will have, or other protic solvents like ethanol will have, in coordinating them. So, as a result, in protic solvents, the more polarizable the atom is, the better nucleophile it is. The reason is that when water coordinates the compound, it really strongly stabilizes it. Which means in water, fluoride anion is very, very stable, and is so stable, in fact, it doesn't want to give up its electron density to an electrophile. It's happy being coordinated to water, whereas bromine is not very well stabilized by water, and as a result, it wants to find an electrophile to stabilize it more. As a result, in terms of nucleophilicity, iodine is actually the strongest nucleophile in solution, or rather iodide anion, followed by bromine, then chlorine, and much, much less by fluorine, which very strongly hydrogen bonds in aqueous solution. The other consideration is that an atom that is more polarizable is more intrinsically stable as an anion. So between F and Br, if we were to put them in gas phase, bromine anion is much more stable than fluoride anion. Because it is much more polarizable, the electron density has more space to move and alleviate those electron-electron repulsions. We can also see this if we compare the strength of the various acids in DMSO, a aprotic polar solvent. HF is much, much weaker in DMSO than HCl and HBr, and in fact, the difference between HF and HCl in DMSO is much greater than it is in water. In water, HF is a pretty strong acid. In DMSO, it has about the same acidity as water does normally. It is significantly weaker because DMSO cannot hydrogen bond, and it doesn't stabilize F- as effectively. As a result, Cl and Br are much more stable, and lead to much stronger acids. As a result, in aprotic solvents, fluoride is very unstable, whereas bromine and iodine are relatively stable. As a result, the less polarizable fluorine is a better nucleophile in aprotic solvents because it's very unhappy and it wants to find an electrophile to stabilize its negative charge. So, in the case of aprotic solvents, nucleophilic strength actually looks like fluorine, then chlorine, then bromine, and lastly iodine, which is the most stable by itself without hydrogen bonding. So, in the case of protic solvents, we have to think of what is known as nucleophilic caging, which is that the solvent stabilizes and cages the nucleophile and weakens it, weakening the smaller nucleophiles more. But in aprotic solvents, the bigger nucleophiles are more stable and happier to stay on their own. Another major factor which impacts nucleophilic strength is resonance effects and orbital characters. Resonance delocalizes electron pairs. As a result, this makes them less available at the target nucleus. And as we said earlier, lone pair availability is a major factor in nucleophilicity. The lone pair has to be able to directly transfer from the nucleophile to the electrophile. And so if it's delocalized, or as I like to say, smeared over the entire molecule, it is going to be much less nucleophilic. Similarly, a orbital that has higher S character, you can think of sp2 lone pairs as being an example, is going to be less nucleophilic. Why? Because those sp2 orbitals have greater S character and hold the lone pair more tightly, closer to the nucleus, since the S orbital is closer to the nucleus than p orbitals. As a result, 
lone pairs in sp2 orbitals are far less nucleophilic. For example, if we were to go ahead and compare these four different species, we find that they have very widely ranging nucleophilicity, even though they all have different lone pairs, and most of them are on nitrogen. Piperidine, on the left, is just a regular sp3 lone pair and has no special orbital effects or resonance. As a result, it is going to be the strongest of these nucleophiles. Pyridine, which is the molecule second in this row, has an sp2 lone pair. It might look like that lone pair could delocalize into the ring, but in actuality, it's actually orthogonal to the ring because of the geometry of the ring. And so it does not delocalize, and instead is just fixed in an sp2 orbital. As a result, it is far less nucleophilic than pyridine on the left, but not quite delocalized enough, and so is actually a decent nucleophile and is more nucleophilic than most alcohols. The third compound, aniline, is an example of a lone pair that's delocalized into a benzene ring. The lone pair can exist at either the ortho or para carbon in terms of a negative uh, charge excess, and as a result is not very available at the nitrogen, making aniline a terrible nucleophile. Finally, we have the nitrate anion. Nitrate is almost completely non-nucleophilic. It might look like oxygen with a negative charge might be a good uh, nucleophile because it's an O minus and we've established that anions are good nucleophiles. However, that O minus is very strongly delocalized between the other oxygen represented in the carbonyl and as well as the fact that the central nitrogen has a net positive formal charge, which very strongly inductively withdraws the negative charge density from both oxygens. So the nitrate ion has both this strong inductive withdrawing, which prevents the lone pairs from being given up, and also resonance between all three oxygens, which makes the lone pairs completely delocalized through the molecule. As a result, nitrate is not a good nucleophile. In fact, you almost never will see nitrate acting as a nucleophile. Finally, to summarize, I want to go ahead and give a sort of overview of what are considered strong versus weak nucleophiles. Now, of course, I have to add the disclaimer that, as we saw when we talked about solvent effects, it's not always consistent. Nucleophiles can flip-flop in strength depending on the solvent. However, generally, we can categorize nucleophiles into sort of four categories. Strong, moderate, weak, and essentially completely non-nucleophilic. Strong nucleophiles favor an SN2 process. They can go ahead and directly attack the carbon uh, at the antibonding orbital. Weak nucleophiles, like alcohols and water, need to wait for SN1. They cannot directly attack, and they have to wait for the formation of a carbocation intermediate, which is much more reactive. Strong nucleophiles tend to be things with negative charge density that are not resonance stabilized. So we see things like Grignard reagents, amides, cyanide, thiolates, alkoxide ions, and often halogens, or halide anions, fall into the range of strong nucleophiles, things with negative charges. Interestingly, uh, phosphines, which are phosphorus uh, compounds, and amines, which are nitrogen compounds, which contain lone pairs, are both strong nucleophiles, and will very readily participate in SN2 reactions, despite not having a negative charge. Moderate nucleophiles are things that have negative charge density, but they may be delocalized, or in the case of nitrogen's sp2 character on the orbital. So things like uh, phenolates, which is a phenoxide anion, something with O- next to a benzene ring, would be an example of a moderate nucleophile. It's partially delocalized into the benzene ring, but it can still act as a nucleophile. Similarly, carboxy acids, RCOO- are moderate nucleophiles. They have a negative charge, but it's delocalized between two oxygens, so it's only a moderate nucleophile as opposed to being a strong one. Depending on the solvent, halogen uh, anions can be strong or weak or moderate, depending on protic or aprotic character. And finally, things like pyridine or imidazole, which have sp2 lone pairs, are relatively good sp2 nitrogen nucleophiles. Weak nucleophiles are typically water and alcohol, because they have a lone pair, but the lone pair is on a relatively electronegative oxygen and does not have an excess negative charge. These always must wait for an SN1 process. Other weak nucleophiles are alkenes. The pi bond in an alkene is actually somewhat nucleophilic and will readily participate in SN1 processes if a cation is available, leading to cyclizations within a carbon skeleton. Non-nucleophilic species include things like nitrate, um, bisulfate, and, car and bicarbonate, which have a negative charge but is strongly delocalized through multiple oxygens. 
these are typically non-nucleophilic. Similarly, things like terp-butoxide and triethylamine look like they would be strong SN2 nucleophiles, but actually because of steric crowding of the terp-butyl group or the three ethyl groups in triethylamine, they are far too hindered to act as SN2 nucleophiles. Last but not least, I want to go over leaving group ability and how it relates to basicity. Unlike nucleophilicity, the ability of a leaving group to leave is very strongly correlated to its basicity, aka its pKb, or you can think of 14 minus the pKa of the conjugate acid. So essentially, the uh, stronger the conjugate acid is, the better the leaving group is. So we want to follow the same rules for determining acidity of a compound to understand how good the leaving group is going to be. And we'll just throw up a chart here of all the different possible leaving groups and how they correlate. The best leaving groups are going to have a low pKa of the conjugate acid, sometimes abbreviated as pKaH. So strong acids are things like the hydrohalic acids, HI, HCl, HBr. Those are very strong acids because I minus, Br minus, and Cl minus are very stable. Thus, they make good leaving groups, things that well stabilize a negative charge density. So those are going to be our best leaving groups, things like I minus. Conversely, our worst leaving groups are things that are, have terrible pKa H's, things you know in the 30s, 40s, or 50s in terms of pKa, things like hydride anion, am uh, amides, and uh, carbon ions are terrible leaving groups. You will never see a carbon-carbon bond or a carbon-nitrogen bond break as a result of a nucleophilic substitution unless there's some sort of enzymatic process dangling a proton at the appropriate position. This will not happen in solution by itself, ever. Other good, other good leaving groups include things like sulfates, uh, which are very heavily resonance stabilized, or water, which is neutral and as a result does not have an excess charge density. Uh, things like pyridine and imidazole, which have uh, sp2 nitrogens, are somewhere in the middle. They're relatively stable and are, again, a neutral species, which makes them a good leaving group. Um, things like alkoxide anions, RO- or F-, are very bad leaving groups because the carbon-oxygen bond and the carbon-fluorine bond is very strong. So even though oxygen is okay at stabilizing a negative charge and fluorine is okay at stabilizing a negative charge, tr actually trying to break the carbon-oxygen or carbon-fluorine bond is extremely energetically intensive, and oftentimes you will need to do other things to try and break that bond, such as protonating the alcohol. Right? RO- is a bad leaving group, and you're never going to just kick out RO- into solution, typically. And with that, we've actually reached the end of the content for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching, and if you enjoyed what you saw, please like and subscribe to the channel. If you want to learn more, check out our other videos in the chemistry playlist, and if you're looking to branch out, check out our other science playlists as well. Thank you so much for watching, and see you next time.